This episode is brought to you by Modal Electronics, who enable you to play and perform powerful sound with their incredible synthesizers. You can enjoy vibrant wavetable patches with the Argon 8 series, or you can produce with state-of-the-art analog-style synth textures with the Cobalt 8 series. To check out Modal Electronics' incredible array of synthesizers, go to modalelectronics.com. Modal Electronics. Dare to sound different. I don't know what you know got me to do it. One thing I really remember from being young was the sense that I love music, I love singing, but I didn't have any sense of what to do with that. You know, it, it, without writing songs, I didn't know what that meant really. I didn't play any instrument particularly well yet. I still don't, but uh, uh, you know, like I'm going to be in, in musicals. I, you know, I, I didn't really have a sense of what to do until I wrote my first songs that really changed everything for me. Like just the, that one day where I suddenly decided that like whatever I was going through in my head, that I should put it down on paper and then try and figure it out on a piano. Like that was the biggest thing for me. Just like the act of doing that one day uh, changed my life. Like from that moment on, I, I felt like I was a songwriter. Like I felt defined, you know, when you're a kid, you're so undefined. You don't, mostly other people tell you what to do. You know, you go to class, you go to school, you go to some activity your parents want you to play, but mostly other people tell you what to do. I think writing that song was sort of the first thing that was all mine. And uh, after it's, that, everything changed. It's such an empowering thing to write songs. Um, would you say that that's the defining thing, you know, above all the other things that you do, being a songwriter, is that the most important thing to you? Oh, well, I mean, making music in general, I would say. I mean, there's songwriting is a big part when you kind of make something from nothing. I think, uh, you know, turning that into a record where you get together with other people and really make it a song, you arr the arrangement and recording, that sort of work is really, really important. And then you can spend years reliving it and filtering your life through it every day on tour, discovering new things about it. I, I think they're all kind of equally parts of it. I wouldn't say any one of them is more important than the other. I, I might lean towards the record making part if I was going to lean towards one of them, I guess. But they're all kind of in, uh, inseparable. Yeah, yeah, very true. And in, ter in terms of um, deciding to do, you know, to be a musician professionally, when did you first start thinking that you wanted to do that? Was it right after writing that first song or when, when did you start harboring those type of ambitions well i think as soon as i wrote the first song I, I felt like that's what i was supposed to do with my life um you know i didn't know how to do that or how to make that a life you know i i, I was i mean i had a skill but i don't think i was very good for a long time uh and even if you are really good it's nearly impossible to make a life out of any kind of art form you know, all of the arts are nearly impossible to make a life doing. But uh, but I think from the moment I wrote that first song, I was predetermined to do just that. And and I when I blinked at that at all. <laughs> when when you um, started gigging, you know, the formation of Counting Crows, was that you you were playing initially um, like acoustically as a duo? Is that is that was that how the band like initially started? No, no. I mean, we were a band first. I was in a couple other bands. And then when that band sort of split up, I was mostly focusing on my other bands. But Dave Bryson and I continued to play acoustic gigs every now and then. But it wasn't like uh, we were starting Counting Crows as an acoustic thing. It was more like it was left over as an acoustic thing from when it had been a band. Um, and I was more focused on Himalayans, my other band, and, and Sorted Humor, my friend's band that I played in. Uh, those were much bigger parts of my life. It wasn't really until we decided to do some more recording as Counting Crows and Dave and I got some other friends together to record um, that I took it seriously. Because we went in the studio and we played with, well, Charlie was there and then uh, our old bass player and drummer, Matt Malley and, and uh, Steve Bowman. Those recordings were really good. Um, and I liked playing with those guys. And that's when I started to take it seriously again. Mm. Um, 
but it was it had never really begun as an acoustic thing that was just because uh the band had split up and i was in two other bands and i wasn't going to be trying to do like a third thing with counting crows i just like to play with dave bryson and so we did and those recordings that, that you're referring to were they the kind of demos that led to that kind of what i hear was like quite a big bidding war between record labels and you guys signing to geffen are, are those those recordings yeah we we had done some originally with the first version of the band um uh some songs the bulldog uh love and addiction shallow days anna begins was in that group and then we did another one with a kind of a little bar band version of the group when we were playing the acoustic shows and that was like mr jones in omaha uh and a couple more 40 years uh and then we did a third set a little while later that was <clears throat> round here which was a cover it was from my other band the himalayans and we played a version, our own version of Round Here, Rain King, uh, that song, uh, Einstein on the Beach, uh, and one more that was from Dave's old band. So we had this demo that had 13 or 14 songs on it. We seemed like such rubes when we sent it out because you're supposed to have one song on a demo, maybe two or three. But we had one with 14 songs. Uh, I don't think it had 15 yet because a little while later we recorded a murder of one too but it had at least 14 songs on it and we sent it out we got a lawyer and we sent that thing out and I heard from quite a few people that they were laughing at us at first because it seemed like what kind of a band sends out a 15 song demo but it had a lot of songs on it like real songs you know and that's that was the kind of the neat trick that caused the bidding war I think is that everybody had this initial reaction where they thought we were idiots and then they listened to it and they freaked out because um, mm. the first album was on that tape plus a bunch of other songs that the record company wanted us to put on the first album that we didn't put on it because i didn't think they were good enough but i mean if there's one thing that seems like gold to record companies it's songs because i mean a great sound might be great this year but it might be dated next year but songs mean you can write songs and that the theoretically lasts, you know? So that's like, mm. that seemed like, I think always a good investment to record companies. That's, I think that's why it caused the bidding war. Yeah, good, good songs, like truly good songs don't date. Right. Um, and truly good songs. I mean, there's that old adage that you can strip away the production of the time and just play it on a guitar or piano. And if it's a really good song, it should, should stand up. Is that something that you believe? Uh, well, yeah, because I mean, mine always start on guitar or piano, well, piano really, but I also really believe that they're better when you put the band in there. Hmm. I just think that, you know, a song is a skeleton. That's all it is. It's like a bare bones skeleton of chords and words, you know, and like the really cool work of being in a band is taking the skeleton and making it into like a song. You know, and that that uh, that's why I think kind of to me the the record making part of it is the most important part. But um, but yeah, it starts with having a good song. You know that and, that'll take far. And how fond are you? Because obviously it is considered a classic album, uh, your debut album, August and everything after. Like, you know, is that an album that you're like particularly fond of uh, in in your back catalogue personally? Because um, I mean, obviously it's you know it's a complete smash multi-platinum like album for all time for a lot of people yeah no it's probably my least favorite although <laughs> i love the songs i just there's something it's got a little bit of a sheen on it to me production wise it's a little slicker and i don't think i it's just because there are about three or four songs that i became much better at singing after that it's not a lot of them it's just three or four of them where like I kind of wasn't ready when we recorded it and I got so much better on those songs that it's hard to start for me to listen to those original versions. But I love the songs on that record, every single one of them. Like I love playing them in concert. I think they're a great batch of songs. It's just, I don't, I don't think, it's not the band either. It's, it's, it's partially the sheen on the record and partially my singing that I don't like as much. It's the only record I look back on and I think, oh, I could have done that better. I don't, I don't think that anywhere else. But it's not like it's 
bad record. I just, I, I think I could have been a little better. That's interesting. What was it like working with T-Bone Burnett on it? I was fine. I mean, T-Bone's a really good teacher in some ways. I think he's really good at, uh, like the hardest part when you're a young band is figuring out what you're going to be and how to become yourself in a way, uh, you know, because it's easy to lose track of what you want to become in a studio. You just go in and you start trying to lay everything down perfectly and you can become this very clean, tidy thing. Uh, and I wanted to really avoid that. And I think we, for the most part, did. Uh, and T-Bone was really good for helping us discover uh, what that was. And I think that's why he, he's, he's made a lot of great first albums with bands. Uh, and even though the, the Wallflowers album is their second album, uh, it's really the one where they figured out how to be the Wallflowers. You know, like the first album, it, it, it was recorded and then it, it kind of flopped and they got dumped. But they really like became a band and Jake figured out what he wanted to do on that second record with T-Bone. I just think he's really good at helping people. You know, he's not one of those guys who comes in with a sound. He, he's going to come in and help you make your sound. I think he's a really good producer that way. Yeah, absolutely. He's he's definitely an iconic producer, but it was just interesting um, how it was considering um, that you feel like personally you you now sing some of the songs better. Which songs are you referring to specifically that you think you sing better? You gotta have to go back and listen to it. I think the three there's three or four of them. I think it's a murder of one. Uh, Anna begins. Uh, maybe uh, what was the other one? It's not Perfect Blue Buildings. It's maybe Sullivan Street. Honestly, I can't remember exactly which one. There was just three or four of them where when we started touring that year and I was singing every night, I got a handle on them that year. And it's not that I sang them poorly on the record. I just hadn't quite figured them out yet. And they got so much better so quickly on tour that I wished I'd been able to sing them that way when we started. Most of the other records, I mean, I sing things differently every night on tour, but I'm not going back and feeling like I wish I'd done the record differently. You know, I don't. It, it's just that one record with like three songs, maybe mm. four. It's a little under half the record. Yeah, I mean, that's a pretty good uh, ratio of things that, you know, shows that you're largely pretty pleased with what you've recorded uh, and obviously rightly oh, yeah. so. I mean, there's nothing else I would change on any other record. That's pretty much it. Um, and in terms yeah. of how, how life yeah. changed after that, like after that debut uh, being such a smash, um, like how did life change? Um, was, was it, uh, and was it a time that you look back on fondly? Well, we got really fucking famous um, all at once, it seemed like. It took a little while to happen, but then it happened very quickly, especially because the record had been building in sales for a few months, but you didn't notice the change in your life. And then we went on our first European tour. So I think when things really blew up in that kind of Beatlemania way, we were out of the country. And, and so we were, it was kind of a shock when we got back. And it was a weird time because uh, Kurt Cobain, who I knew died while we were on that, uh, while we were in Europe. And that made me really nervous. We did the photo shoot and the interviews for uh, the cover of Rolling Stone, which was another thing that was making me really nervous. And then we landed back in America and like got mobbed everywhere I went. And uh, it just all kind of came together at the same time and kind of freaked me out for a little while. You know, it's just such a change. Mm. I was a pretty shy person. I wasn't really good at dealing with people. And all of a sudden, I, You're like I said, on i was in europe for a month or two and so when i got back it was just very sudden that like I, I remember i had been going to the jazz fest in new orleans for years before i was famous or anything you know and we landed in america from london in uh new orleans and we were playing during jazz fest and i went out to the festival at the fairgrounds that first day after we got there and i got mobbed like in a scary way it, it was uh, i didn't realize what was happening I, I just couldn't figure it out I, I when i left the country a little while before that i hadn't been that famous and then we got back to town and it was like the beatles in hard days night you know <laughs> kind of getting chased in the streets um so it, it, it uh it shook me up a little bit 
was there any part of you that enjoyed that or was it all just really not like your type of thing and you're just in it for the music? No, I mean, I didn't enjoy that part of it. Uh, I, there's a lot of things about success I like. I mean, tons. It's great. I'm, for one thing, like, I've been successful. You know, I can take care of myself now and I can take care of the band and we our crew is stuck around for 20 years. I like, uh, sometimes I get to meet really cool people. I can get into uh, gigs for free and whenever I want. I mean, there's a lot of really, lots of great stuff about it. I just wasn't ready to deal with all those people. That's something I still struggle with. I've just always been a very private, uh, you know, person and <coughs> just getting mobbed by people that I just had a lot of trouble with. It just, you know, that's part of my personality, you know, but you know, you also learn to deal with it. It's not like the end of the world. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it seems like there are a lot of things about success that most people uh, would would take to those things that you've just uh, just described. But uh, the second album, how much was that about kind of picking up the pieces again uh, after those experiences following August and everything after? Oh, it's completely about it. Yeah, I mean, that's what I mean, because I write about <coughs> my life and that's what my what was going on in my life was um, dealing with that recovering from it and like learning also but learning to live with it um like i mean i've said this a million times but if you woke up on mars tomorrow it would take you a little while to get used to the gravity you know you'd adjust but at first you'd be bouncing all over the place and you know i think that's what would happen to me i just got i started bouncing all over the place and then i got used to how to walk kind of had to learn to walk all over again and that yeah. record's all about that and and obviously you ended up as a result of finding that success, you know, straight away after your first album, you ended up uh, obviously playing live, uh, meeting people, supporting people. Uh, what were some of the highlights in terms of pe people who you like played gigs with and met? Like, who were you particularly stoked to meet around that time? Well, I mean, uh, I mean, a lot of the guys I met before we were successful, like you know, Kurt and <clears throat> Dave Grohl, those guys I met when we, you know, we were label mates. So I met them early on. Uh, same with like the Posies, uh, Maria McKee, all the bands that were on Geffen I met back then and the Jayhawks. Uh, and then, you know, we went on tour that first year and I met a lot of indie bands that I loved, like the Gigolo Ants. And I got to meet the, maybe the biggest thing was Big Star getting to be friends with Alex Chilton and Jody Stevens from Big Star because they were probably my biggest influence in life. And we, we gigged with them. Alex came out and opened for us for a summer. Uh, we, we, we opened for the Stones too, which on that first wow. year, and that was really cool. Um, they asked us to do the whole summer with them, but we had just booked our, our first sort of headline summer tour. So we just asked them if we could schedule like eight gigs in and out of our own shows. But I, what I remember, really, it's become up a lot this year because the first gig with the Stones was at RFK Stadium in uh, in D.C. And it was on my 30th birthday. And I remember thinking, wow, I'm 30 years old today. The Stones, it was 94, have been gigging for a little over 30 years. That's wild. You know, like, as long as I've been alive, there's been Rolling Stones. And... What, what would it be like to be in a band for that long? And now, you know, it's, I've been in this band for 30 years this year, you know, like, uh, so that's, it's weird. Of course, we're nowhere near as big as the Stones and we're never going to be, but still I've kept the band together for 30 years and we've been making music. We've got a hit song in America uh, and in a lot of other places right now. So uh, it's like, we're still a, a vital working band, not just playing legacy gigs, you know, greatest hit shows. Uh, mm. So that's kind of wild, because in a way, the thing I was wondering about that day with the Stones has sort of come true for us, too, which is pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you, you're going back out on the road or, or rather, you know, going out on the road for the first time in ages, it must be. Um, how yeah. do you feel about that? Um, pretty good. I, I, I mean, I was concerned about. I'm not really concerned about the band because we're on stage, there's separation and we're all vaccinated. I, I was concerned about the audiences though. Um, but so, I mean, I did a lot of consultation on it 
and it, it seems to me like it's the general consensus seems to be that it's it's completely safe outdoors right now to play shows and it can be safe indoors in the right places um so we had a tour that was 22 indoor gigs and 10 outdoor gigs and now it's i think 27 outdoor gigs maybe and four indoor gigs something like that or five it's pretty we flipped it around and made sure to make it safer I, i'm really looking forward to playing uh it's weird to think about traveling around and you know we've all been indoors for so long in our own houses uh i mean i'm in england right now it's the first time i've gone anywhere in a year and a half yeah i thought that looked so like england i was like god america is not that different from the uk <laughs> i'm uh, you're in I'm england not, i'm in the west yeah well yeah it's... farm this is where I actually where i wrote all the songs for this record wow um and and in terms in terms of um you know, lockdown, like, were you, did you manage to stay creative and productive throughout this, this period? Well, sort of, I mean, I wrote all the songs for the new record before, um, and we had gone into the studio in, er, in late February. So we were about 85% of the way done with Butter Miracle when the lockdowns hit. So we postponed for a few months and then we figured out a really careful way of finishing up the record and we did that um in july so yeah. you know i i had kind of was able to do the really important creative stuff mostly before we got hit with this so i didn't have a lot more to do after that um most of the last year i've just been teaching myself to cook different things that's kind of what i've done you know outside of the record work that needed to get done and in terms of in terms of Butter Miracle, uh, it's called Sweet One. You know, Butter Miracle, Sweet One. Does that mean that there are follow ups uh, coming? Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, it's called Sweet One because it's the only one I wrote. <laughs> but uh, but I I really and also because composing something <laughs> that works like this is kind of like a an act of will and imagination. You know, you don't know whether it's actually going to work until you finish and you can put it all together like i i mean i composed it to do this what it does to flow between the songs but until we finished mixing i i wasn't really it had just been a product of my imagination and it wasn't until then that i was like oh it does work and that might have been one of the most satisfying moments of my career hearing it all the way through um and i think after that i decided i wanted to i really like working in this form i've never really tried it before I, i'd like to keep doing it for a while um, I'm really intrigued by this concept of writing suites of songs like that. Mm, yeah. I, I mean, I'm going to try, I mean, that's one of the reasons I came back over to England because I wrote all of it here and I wanted to try and write another one. So we'll see. All right. So that's, so that's kind of what you're, what you're doing at the moment. Well, sort of, mostly I've been walking through the woods and and going down to the pond and fishing i haven't really done shit yet but i set up a piano in the room where it was i had a keyboard that i left here at my friend's house um so i i mean it's set up and i suppose as soon as i'm done with jet lag or doing press all day i'm gonna go in there and start playing again i haven't really done anything yet though what is the ratio like this is an, uh, a question that i'm very interested in because more or less, the answer seems to be swayed in rather a depressing uh, way. Um, what is the ratio now for you between actually playing, writing, creating, uh, doing music stuff, and doing stuff like this, podcast, interviews, emails, business admin, and that, you know, what's, what's the ratio between those two sides of what, what you have to do? Like today is 100% uh podcasts and uh interviews uh but in general uh, like well it's always been uh I, i've never been someone who writes all the time i i would like i'll write a record and then we'll make the record and then we'll go tour for two or three years and i won't write at all and then we'll write another record or i'll write another record you know I, so i've always been someone who didn't i don't write all the time i've never been a guy who's just always going and writing songs um I, I was when I first started out for years, but once I was in the band and really seriously working in Counting Crows, uh, 
because largely you're touring, you know, and I, I can't write much on tour because I don't mm. I don't play guitar. So uh, and I can't bring a piano into my hotel room every night. So I've always taken, you know, the rest of my life has taken up more time than writing. Um, I write in bursts, you know, uh, and I, I suppose I'll do that again now. Once I start, though, the problem is I can't really do much else. Once I start writing, I, I become obsessive about it and I just do that. Um, you kind of get get lost in that world. In terms of when was the last time that you guys played live then? August of 2019. Okay, so and, and well, will, will yeah. you have to rehearse a lot before this, before going out again in August? Oh yeah, I don't know about a lot, but we're definitely going to take a week and put some time in because, well, we've never really played these songs the way they are because I mean we played together in the studio, uh, but like there's all these background vocals now that we have to learn that we worked on for this record. A lot of them were sung by my friend, Dave Drago. He sang about 90% of the backgrounds on this record. So we've got to learn wow. the backgrounds, how to play and sing this stuff. Uh, plus we haven't played in two years. So there's, you know, be some rehearsals, but we rehearse every day on tour anyways, to work up new songs. We, we wow. literally, we use soundcheck as rehearsal every single day. Really? Yeah. So to, to work up new songs that are in the set list or to change the set list around? Change it. Well, it changes every night, but uh, we, we don't play the same set every night at all. We, we write a new set list every day. Um, That's so cool. But That's we so definitely different. use soundtrack every day because there's some songs you haven't played in years. And somebody's like, I want to play I'm Not Sleeping or I want to play Amy Hit the Atmosphere. And then we got to all learn it, you know, and we so we we use every day for rehearsals. Or, or just to like, let's someone has an idea about putting a new vocal, a background vocal, or a breakdown in one of the songs, and we'll work on that. One way, one way or another, we rehearse for about an hour every day. Really, before a show? Oh yeah. yeah and and in terms of during that rehearsal, will, will you kind of like sing softer and stuff to protect your voice, or do you just play? Uh, it depends. Different every day. It depends if my voice is tired. But you know, you kind of have to do it anyways because you got a sound check, and mm. so we use the sound check. You know, we'll we'll get our you know, everything on stage working, but also we'll work on stuff. So it's a mixture. Like we we figured out every tour, we figure out two or three songs that enable everybody to play every instrument. Cause that's the other problem. Everybody plays a lot of different instruments. Charlie plays organ, keyboard, uh, piano, Wurlitzer, accordion. Immer plays mandolin, pedal steel, acoustic guitar, electric guitar, slide guitar, you know, like, so there's, a, a Rickenbacker 12 string. There's so many instruments that everybody plays that you kind of have to sound check because they all sound, you know, you got to make sure everything's working. Um, so that that's part of it too. Cause the guys, the people play so many different instruments in this band that everybody's always switching off between stuff. So <laughs> there's a lot to get like set up every day. That's yeah. It's such a cool thing for your fans to do that, to make the effort to change things up, to play different songs. Is, is that something that you're conscious of doing because of that, because the fan base would enjoy it? Or is that just because you don't want to be playing the same stuff every day? Oh, it's, it's much more for us. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it actually drives the fans crazy. If, if you gave most fans a choice, they would have a list of songs that they really want to hear. And then you'd have to play those songs every night. Um, because at our shows, inevitably, there's something you don't hear because there's almost nothing we play every night. Like, I think on this tour coming up, we will play the new suite every night and we'll play probably along December every night. But that's the only song that I'm never tired of. A every other song, there's some days you just don't want to play it. That's really interesting. Yeah. And so, so would you get away without playing like Mr. Jones, for example? Uh, I get away with it. The crew, not so much. <laughs> On the gigs where we don't play Mr. Jones, my crew tells me as they're breaking down after the show, the fans are yelling at them. So. Really? But like, I, I, that's interesting because most people, like if you're fan, a fan of a band, like, like a real fan, most of the time it's like, you know, I don't think like Van Morrison fans want to hear Brown Eyed Girl like that much or like, I don't know, Elton John fans probably don't want to hear Crocodile Rock that much or like, do you know what I mean? Like once you yeah. get into a band and the, their depth, like the hit, the, the big hits, like, or like Earth, Wind & Fire fans probably don't want to hear like September that much. They could live without it. Like it's, it's well, weird. I think, 
But all those guys have a lot more hits than we do. I mean, Absolutely. they're swimming in hits, those bands. And I bet, I think Van Morrison fans have just given up. <laughs> they're, they're not getting Brown Eyed Girl. They're not getting Gloria. Uh, I mean, I saw Van Morrison a lot growing up, and they were fascinating concerts. And it probably formed some of my ideas about what I want, how I like concerts to be, because he was ornery that way, you know? But I don't know. I mean, the truth is, like, I love Mr. Jones. I, I absolutely love that song. And I want to play it most of the time. I just, there's just nothing except for a long December that I want to play every single night because some night you get tired of everything. Mm. And I'm rarely tired of Mr. Jones, but I, it does happen. And I don't, I don't want to hate any of my songs. So if I'm really tired of something, I'm not playing it because I'm not going to ruin it for myself. These are, these are my songs, you know? Yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, I don't want to ruin Mr. Jones for myself, but also I like playing, you know, we have a lot of songs at this point um, and I love all of them. The singles were never necessarily more important to me. We didn't know they were singles when we wrote them. And yeah, it yeah. with us, often it's just the song that's short enough to go on the radio. You know, it mm. was sometimes it was just the only song on the record that would work because we wrote so many stupidly long songs. Um, so they don't really have more importance. Like, I love Mr. Jones because it's great. Yeah. I don't know if I love it more than Rain King or more than Round Here, though. I mean, I love those three get played in most concerts because they're great songs and I love them. But not every show because, you know, you know, because you know what fits in that uh, round here slot is Sullivan Street fits really good in that round here slot. Wherever you're going to play round here in a show, Sullivan Street would be really good in that slot, too. And I love playing Sullivan Street. But we're probably not going to play both of them in the same night, you know, so one of them doesn't get played some nights. You know, uh, Mr. Jones is a little harder to replace because it's just so popular. Mm. Um, mm. But there well, are everybody has those. There. All really successful bands have those type of uh, songs, yeah. but you mentioned Along December's the song that you don't get tired of. So why do you never get tired of that song? Why does it mean so much to you? I don't know. It just never bores me. I, I, I just, there's something about that song. I knew it when I wrote it too. It's just perfect. It just, I, it was just something, it almost halfway wrote itself. It just feels like it's supposed to be there all the time. And I, I never, ever get tired of playing it and i don't know why that is because that's not true of any other song but i it's just i don't know that it's my favorite if you ask me my favorite song like or i'm i'm, I'm the proudest of maybe palisades park because it was such a challenge and it was so cool until this new suite which i really really am excited to play you know as as a whole in concert but always Palisades Park was such an accomplishment and such a challenge to play that I, I just, it was to play it because but there have been nights where I was okay not playing it, but I don't know. Long said, I just never get tired of it. It's just, it's always a pleasure. I, I can't tell you, I really don't know. It's just got something. And, and in terms of uh, when you when you wrote it, was that a song that took a long time to to write, or, or I think you just mentioned that it, it kind of came out quite quickly. Like, is that the case for for a lot of a lot of songs? Like, how kind of painstaking is the writing process? Oh yeah, no. Oh, it depends on the song. Um, but I mean, like, ranking is about forty five minutes total to write it. Um, uh, a long December is. It's definitely under two hours because I, I remember that I was at work at the Viper Room that night and I went to my friend's house for a little while afterwards. Uh, Samantha Mathis and Tracy Falco, they had a house we nicknamed Hillside Manor. And I, I was there from about two till four. And then I, I lived right up the hill from them and I drove home around 4 a.m. And I know that Long December was finished by 6 a.m. Um, so it was like under two hours. I don't know that I started writing it right away, but I finished it less than two hours later and it was recorded it was written and recorded in under 24 hours probably 18 hours because we were in the middle of making recovering satellites right then uh the next day i went to the hospital to visit my friend she had been hit by a car i was spending a lot of my days in the hospital with her um she got pretty wrecked she was in there for months um which is kind of what the song's about uh she was in the hospital i went there during the day 
uh, I'm on the way to the hospital. I stopped at Geffen at the clubhouse on sunset and I played it for my A&R guy. I was like, cause he's a good friend of mine. I was like, you're not gonna believe this. I did this in the middle of the night last night. I played it for him. And then I went to the hospital and then uh, I went to the studio about four or five o'clock. And uh, I played it for the band before dinner, taught it to them right after dinner. And we recorded it in a few hours. Like it's live, that, that recording is entirely live. There's no overdubs on it, except when we finished it, it's about take six maybe. And then we all, we played take seven and we went back and we're like, no, that was it. The one before this was it. We went into the kitchen, everybody got a drink. And while we were in there, I grabbed the engineer and said, come on back to the studio, press record, I got to sing. And I sang one line to the harmonies all the way through the song. And then I go, okay, do it again. Give me another track. And I did the other line of harmonies and that's it. There are no other overdubs on the song except for those two harmonies. Um, the rest of it's completely live. It was all written and recorded in under 24 hours. Like that, it's about like by midnight we're done. You know, I, I, cause I remember I made it to the Viper room before closing that night and played it in my car. I had a cassette that I got and I played it in my car outside the Viper room. Uh, cause I, I had a convertible and I played it for them outside the club you know, right in front of the door. Um, so yeah, I mean, like I, it was done and, you know, like by 10 or 11 o'clock that night, it was finished. And in terms of the, because you've got, that shows that you've got um, quite a rootsy, like heartfelt, uh, there's there's lots of kind of organic instrumentation in, in a lot of your music. I mean, it's the, the, the type of warm sounds that uh, I think a lot of listeners to this podcast are fans of but also you know that i love like i don't know i keep coming back to to records made like this with this type of instrumentation um how have you found the uh effect of technology on music like and to what extent do you do you pay attention and, and like kind of technological ad advancements um or or do you just find yourself revisiting the old school way of doing it Oh, no, I think the technology is fantastic. Honestly, uh, Pro Tools, that's the greatest invention ever. I mean, because it, it just, forgetting my band, you used to have to have a record contract to make a record. I mean, for the most part, maybe you could make one record, but then you're bankrupt. You know, like, but now everybody can make a record. You don't have to go into a recording studio. You can do it on your computer. I mean, it, it's incredible. It, it made it so, so many more people can make music. And also you used to have to have a record contract to get your music out there because it was expensive to press it up and hire people in trucks to drive it all over the world. But now you can just upload to Bandcamp. I mean, I think that's amazing because there are so much as a fan, there's way, way, way more good music nowadays. Like it, as someone who's obsessed with music, I am drowning in stuff to listen to. I can never get through it all because it's, there's so much good shit. And it also means that great bands stay together for longer because mm. they're not they're not driving themselves out of house and home trying to record music you know uh, and I, I as a fan i absolutely love that as a musician i also feel like look pro tools like everything can be a method to make boring flat music uh, because it enables you to just not be creative if you want to mm. you know drum machines make it so you don't have to play, play drums so you can be lazy with a drum machine, but you don't have to be lazy. All these things are just tools and in the right hands. I mean, look at what Pharrell has done with the drum machine over the last 20 years, the loops, the, the, the incredible like drum loops he's created for a million great funk songs. Um, it's just, it enables you to be more creative and yes, lots of people, it enables them to be less creative, but I don't care about how they're fucking up. I'm just like happy to have the tools to make great music. Um, it's just so easy. I mean, I mean, look, making records is hard because you have to be creative and work. But a lot of the things that used to make it impossible or really difficult just financially are gone now. And for me, that's like, or I'll tell you a simple thing. Do you know what a Mellotron is? Yeah, of course. Okay, so one of the greatest instruments ever invented, but also one of the most temperamental. And it's in, they're impossible to keep together because you you have these tapes and they're they're dying. You know what I mean? Like the tapes are dying every day because they're so fragile. 
Um, but a Mellotron, that's the greatest thing. I mean, what a, a, the a, you could be so creative with one of those things. I, I love them. And I've loved them. I discovered them really. I mean, I've always known what they were, but we started using them on recovering the satellites. You can hear them all. They're the first things you hear on that record. Um, and I just love them. Some Swedish guy a few years ago invented, put together a completely sampled Mellotron where he sampled every single Mellotron or Chamberlain sound that had ever been created, put it on one of these things in a completely like midied out way, uh, and made it work down to the thing like you used to push on the keys and if you push harder on a Mellotron, you could hear it go because you're actually pushing on the tape. And he made that thing so it actually does that. You have every sound that's ever been available on a Mellotron or a Chamberlain in this machine. Plus you can mess around with the keys just the way Mellotrons work. And yet it's never going to die. It's just solid state, you know what I mean? And uh, it's my favorite thing. We used it all over this record because it's so great. I mean, we've always used Mellotrons, but now we don't have to worry about bringing it out on tour and ruining it. You know, this 50, 60 year old instrument. Yeah. Now we just have them and it's just, oh my God, it's so, it's so great. I mean, in most cases, the actual instrument's still going to sound better. Like I don't want to use the Mellotron to make or a synthesizer to make Hammond B3 sounds because the Hammond B3 organ still sounds better and a real guitars still sound better but having all this other stuff available to be creative with it just opens up so many doors for creativity you know mm. i mean I, I i'm about to sing on my friend's record again uh, this band you know the australian band gang of youths mm. yeah they're one of my favorite i think they're the best rock and roll band in the world right now and when mm. i was over here like a year and a half ago i sang on their new record but they scrapped it and they're doing it again in a different fashion now. All oh, right. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna go sing on it as soon as my quarantine's done. I'm gonna go up to London and sing on it again. And one of the songs he asked me, they, one of the songs they just want to have me sing bits and sample them and mix them up all over the record, all over this one song. And they asked me if that was okay, and I was like, yeah, of course, that's great. That's a like, that's a really creative, cool idea. And I'm, I'm all for it. And you couldn't have done it without like Pro Tools, you know. You know, it makes it possible to do things like that. Um, you know, I just, yeah, I guess I'm, technology to me is the greatest thing in the world. And it, look, here's the thing. Humanity sucks. <laughs> you get enough humans <laughs> in the room. And once you get over four or five people, someone's going to do something stupid and shitty, you know, but you don't have to be that person. Mm. And tools are the same way. Like a hammer is great. Wonderful for nails, terrible for heads. You know, so as long as you're not hitting anybody in the head with it, you know, look, here's a nail. It's going to be fantastic with nails, you know, and uh, it's just how you use the hammer. Social media, technology, they're all the same. It's yeah, just, yeah. It's just how you use the hammer. Yeah, it's like, it's like anything. It's just like the extent to which you indulge or overindulge or use something tastefully or, you know. Like if you go to McDonald's a cup, you know, uh, every now and again, it's all right. If you just subside only off McDonald's, it's not going to be great for you. If you have a couple of beers in the evenings, good fun. If you have like 40, you'll probably feel like shit the next day. Uh, and, you know, if you make all your music void of any creativity, uh, just using Pro Tools in a boring way, yeah, it won't, won't sound good, but like tastefully. Yeah, I mean, you've got obviously the attitude that makes the most sense. And so I wanted to finish off by asking, um you mentioned gang of use so who else uh because you mentioned you you've got like more music to listen to than you can get through and that there's more music uh being made that's great than ever so who are the artists and uh, bands and stuff that really excite you oh uh, well i mean we run a little indie music festival too i mean we have the, we have the underwater sunshine podcast me and my friend james where we just spend all day dissecting and going through all kinds of music uh, and we have an indie music festival where we're constantly surrounded by all these great musicians. I um, I think Gang of Youth is probably the best band I've heard in years and the best live show I've seen in decades. Uh, but also uh, Matt Susich and Sean Barna, who are two songwriters, New York guys, who are, they're going to come out and flip flop opening the first parts of the tour. And they're brilliant. I mean, Matt is like a, an incredible New York songwriter, like a modern Paul Simon. Sean Barna is like this wild like glam voice of gay life in america right now he's he reminds me of like ian hunter in some ways and uh i just think he's brilliant uh and then frank turner's coming out for the last part of the tour 
because mm-hmm. we were supposed to do a tour entirely together last year, but of course we had to cancel that. And Frank's a guy, you know, came out of a punk scene and then turned himself into this whole different thing. And I just think he's a, a brilliant voice. I, I always think of him as a new artist and I realize Frank's been around for 25 years now, probably more. Uh, there's a band called Kid Sister in uh, New York, just these three girls. I mean, I guess when I met them, they were like all 20 or one of them was 18. They're a power trio, they, they're just fantastic. Kid Sister, S-I-S-T-R for the second word. Sunflower Bean, great New York band playing the last few years. Uh, that one of the best live shows I've seen and their album 22 in Blue, I mean, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, God, there's just so many bands uh, right now that are so good. Um, mm. Yeah, I'm, I, I mean, I get really excited about it because you just, you can like, as a music geek, I, I never run out of shit anymore. But there's never a day where I can't find something to check out. Uh, there's a band from Philadelphia called Hop Along. Two words, Hop Along. Francis Quinlan, this woman is, she's like, it's like a modern Talking Heads. I mean, they don't sound like Talking Heads, but it's like interesting music that you kind of have to turn your head sideways for it to make sense. <laughs> there's some combination between Talking Heads and Throwing Muses. Uh, she's a brilliant, brilliant songwriter. Um, yeah, I just there's just so much. You sometimes struggle to get up in the morning or wind down for bed at night. I used to find it so difficult. I woke up with no sense of positivity and brightness. I was void of motivation and spirit. This changed completely when I started waking up with a loomy body clock. These incredible devices mimic the light and colour of a real sunrise and sunset, transforming the experience of waking up and going to sleep completely. Rather than being suddenly woken up with an alarm clock, the Lumi body clock will wake you up gradually with a natural sunrise. The Lumi body clock has been shown to improve the quality of sleep and awakening and to boost mood and productivity in clinical trials. You can personalise your sunrise and sunset from 15 to 90 minutes with their clinically tested unique natural light and more than 20 sleep and wake sounds. We all deserve to sleep well and to wake up feeling fresh. So if you're finding this a challenge and you want to try a new approach, go to lumi.com. If you're enjoying the Greatest Music of All Time podcast, you can keep up to date with all of our latest episodes for free by subscribing. If you're watching on YouTube, the subscribe button is located at the top of the Tom Cridland YouTube page. It's also at the bottom right of any video that you watch on YouTube. If you're listening on an audio platform, such as Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can subscribe at the top of the page.